with the Ron and Fez Show. Thanks for being with us on a Tuesday night. And I think at the very least, Fezzy, we've improved our bumper music. There's some continuity to it now. We're taking bold steps forward oh, here. It's all about the funk right now on the Ron and Fez Show. Fezzy, uh, Fidel Castro rejected charges by President Bush saying that... Castro promotes sex tourism in Cuba. Then he went on to bring up Bush's past drinking habits. Does uh, Cuba promote sex tourism? You know, it's, it's really sad where I tend to believe the homicidal dictator over our own president. Is that right? You don't think that they promote sex tourism there? Well, Fidel said, you know, hey, most of our tourism is Canadian senior citizens. And, and we're not getting them prostitutes. Don't kid yourself. Fezzi, look around. Uh, Las Vegas promotes sex tourism. Uh, Miami Beach promotes sex tourism. There are prostitutes actually flock to Boston for this convention, and then they're going to move it down to New York for that convention. If there's a convention... If people gather, there's going to be prostitutes. What's funny, though, is Fidel Castro just comes back with, yeah, well, you're drunk. Yeah, that always hurts <laughs> when you have to bring that back up. Now, I remember President Bush addressing the U.N. about this, yeah. about sex tourism and slave trading and everything else. Yeah. Cuba never came up. It was always Bangkok or Singapore. Yeah, and I just, when I even heard the speech, I was writing the names down as possible next vacations. <laughs> Get my travel agent on the phone. The weird thing is after he said Bangkok, he giggled. And I have no idea why. I was, you know, I didn't go to Yale. But uh, I would think that you'd be able to get p prostitutes pretty cheap if you were in Cuba. I'd say it'd probably cost you something along the lines of shoelaces. Well, Fidel had said before that their prostitutes are pretty smart because they have a really low uh, rate of AIDS cases. Yeah. Coming from prostitution. I would actually say this. Uh, look, here's my deal. It's a Coke and two cigarettes. Who's in? The girls are just all gathered around your car and excited to see you there. Your 57 Chevy that you rented in, uh, in downtown Havana. We got your newest car, sir. It's a 57 Chevy with bald tires. With this, I was really interested in the alcoholism point of view because what I read about it was, quoting that book, uh, Bush on the Couch. Yeah. I had never heard this about self-treated alcoholics that uh, they that there's a possibility where they'll make up enemies in order to have something to fight against well the deal is this if uh, and it's what a lot of the 12 step people feel like that it is that you you're what they call a dry drunk you're basically going through life like you're you're still partying you've got all the same bad things you're just not drinking. So you're going to be quicker to get into fights uh, like a drunk, uh, having affairs like a drunk, because you haven't done the full work. That's the belief out there. So you've changed the physical part of it, but not the behavioral part. Yeah, everything is exactly the same except for you're not drinking. And Fidel brings this up. Yeah, it's not fair. <laughs> to hey, quote book, Bush on the Couch. W were we able to get the Bush on the Couch guy on the show, J-Dubs? Uh, not yet, no. What do you do? You're afraid to call? You just send emails? Oh, we've got J-Dubs on the couch with yeah. his feet up. All right, let's t turn all those guests over to Tommy Bateman. Let's see what Tommy Bateman right. can do here in the short run. No problem. All right? And I just don't know why they give us the shyest people. Just, uh, well, I've been sitting in the office and they haven't called. Yeah, today I came in the office. Tommy Bateman sitting there in the dark and then asked me if I've seen J-Dubs. Yeah. So I don't know if he's going to be able to get us an author <laughs> if he can't find J-Dubs anywhere. Well, J-Dubs locked his own keys in the car. <laughs> the Iraqi soccer team scored a win over Saudi Arabia in its Woo! first major competition since the regime changed. Good, Fezzi. They're finally they're back in this thing and they're turning the program around. So was the last of torture really the difference maker here well i don't know because they only got tortured if they lost can you imagine you lose you're losing a game uh you know it's the second half you're down two zip knowing hey if we don't get if we don't at least pick up a tie our feet get beat on and we're going to be thrown in a huge pool full of dung you know, if I knew Uday was waiting for me with the Welcome Home Committee, I would probably try at some point during the uh, second period of half, whatever they do in soccer, to put on street clothes and try to get out of the place. But can you imagine you're the goalie of that team, Fez? You give up two the way the other guys are looking at you during the game. Fez, we're going to get our feet beaten. You like your feet beaten? 
Uh, maybe you like the smell of raw sewage. Yeah. I, I wonder if you could even say to a day, I know that you're upset with our goalkeeper, but look at me. I came out of this thing. I scored big. I don't think I should get the same beat as him. I'm pulling my end of the weight here. I'm doing my job. I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. So uh, this team is back. Now, this is another weird thing about soccer. Apparently, the Saudi team... Well taken care of. Uh, they get money. They get all you know a great lifestyle. The Iraqi team basically playing like with the old socks in the in the middle of a dirt field. How come you can go out and beat that team? Maybe it's just a desire. Maybe the Saudi Arabian team got too fat. It doesn't work in the NFL. It doesn't work that way there. It's normally the best team with the best stuff wins. That just doesn't matter in soccer. Soccer is a crazy, stupid sport. I don't care what Johnny Punani says. The sport makes no sense. Well, there was the South African soccer referee who pulled out the gun and shot the coach dead for disagreeing with a call. That I wouldn't mind seeing in Major League Baseball. Occasionally, some of these guys can run it out, kicking dirt and spit, and they need to be shot. Could you imagine if the ump just pulled the uh, pulled the gun out from behind his chest plate? Well, I mean, before we even get into the fact of why did he shoot him or what happened there, what is the what is the ref doing with a gun on him during a game? It's not like he was so mad he went out to the car, grabbed himself a thirty eight, and came back. He had it in his belt the whole time. He knew what was going. on. He knows how rough some of these soccer games can get. Yeah, well. <laughs> You gotta let, have it exposed. Wear it on a shoulder holster. Let people know who they're dealing with. I'm sure he intended it for the fans in case they came after him. He probably never intended on using it on a coach. Yeah, but that's what they say: is don't have a gun unless you're prepared to use it. And the last I saw about this, this guy was still on the run. They still hadn't caught him. So somehow we did this and got away. Well, who was gonna grab? Him? <laughs> Again, that poor goalkeeper. <laughs> All you're trying to do is make it through a game. Uh, what was that movie that Bruce Willis was in it where a guy was running for a touchdown? He starts shooting at people that are coming after him. The Last Boy Scout. The Last Boy Scout. One of the really great bad movies of all time. Yeah, him and Damon Wayans. <laughs> yeah, Damon Wayans and uh, Bruce Willis. And it was kind of football in the future fest. He just couldn't. He just had to get in the end zone and was shooting the defensive backs as they were coming in on him. Now, Bill Cower, Pittsburgh Steelers coach, he got a two-year extension yeah. from the Steelers. They love him in Pittsburgh, Fez. I can't believe this isn't just borrowed time he's on. You get a two-year extra deal, that's that's big in that sport. With uh, You know, he tried so hard to make the Cordell Stewart thing work. Years and years of thinking, all right, this could be Cordell's year. Yeah. Then got lucky with Maddox from the Arena League. Right. And then Maddox, you know, had his great year and then started showing his age. But you're going to blame all that on uh, Cower? Yeah, I do. I blame that on Cower. Why? I mean, he's not out there scouting the team. He doesn't get to make the picks. He's got a GM. He takes the team out there every year and turns them into something. I mean, who else better to take over Pittsburgh? I would say I would you know I would probably put in uh, one of those discipline coaches like a Tom Coughlin or something. Well, Tom Coughlin's already with another team. You only get so many coaches that you're able to grab. I'd be happy to have Cowher as my coach. I really would. He keeps the com team competitive. The problem with them is it's very difficult to get over that lip every single year. I think with him, he just he stays focused. He doesn't seem, I mean, not that that's a bad thing, but he doesn't seem to be willing to change things up when they're not working. Yeah. Ryan Seacrest, uh, on air with Ryan Seacrest, the Sinclair, uh, Sinclair Group, they're pulling that show off of more than 20 of its TV stations. Seacrest out. Out on 20 stations. Well, here, uh, if, actually, this could end up being a good thing because the Sinclair uh, station is not always the biggest ones as far as I know. I mean, I think in this market, he's like Seacrest is on the UPM show or something. It's, have you ever watched his daytime show? Yeah. The only time it really works is during American Idol where he can go backstage at Idol. Other than that, they fake a lot of guests. They're like, all right, we have Will Smith on this week. But Will Smith is not there. He throws it to a tape where he goes out on the press tour and sits there and meets Will Smith in front of the big 
I Robot poster like every other uh, show. That's fun for the studio audience. Yeah, this, well, the studio audience is only about 100 anyway. But I, I, he doesn't got the really big guests showing up. I don't know why he's in L.A. There's no other shows to promote at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But I still think that they're having trouble grabbing the really big guests. Yeah, and it is amazing how it's like he, when they promote that show and it's an idol person, like the person that just got voted off of Idol. Yeah. It's we had Jennifer Hudson in the right. studio. And it's a huge promotion. Yeah, and everybody goes over big there. And that's the stuff that they do, the backstage uh, Vital stuff. The other problem is I don't know if they know what kind of show they are. They're, they, like, have guests like it's the old Merv Griffin show. But then they also do, we'll do Hollywood makeovers, and they try to act like there's some kind of an early morning show at the same time. I don't think that they've got the guts right now to go, all right, let's bring on a band, let's have an actor, let's have a comic. We're doing a real old-fashioned talk show. And if this thing's starting to fail on them, it's, you know, it's uh, only likely because... This guy does so much. He's working constantly. But none of it's really strong anyway. It's not like, hey, he's working so hard on his other gigs. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy schedule that he has. Tomorrow on UPN, they're going to debut uh, Amish in the City. Finally. That's where it's the five Amish young people that are, uh, who leave their community for Hollywood. I think this is going to be a huge hit, Fezzi, because who doesn't want to see an Amish kid the first day he's smoking crack or the first time he's with two hookers at the same time? I think it's exciting for everyone. So I guess they put them um, with six other kids, six young people that uh, I think they call them the normals. As well, that's opposed nice. to the that's, Amish. That's really nice. <laughs> You're, uh, uh, okay, if they're the normals, then who are we? I guess the Amish do this when their kids hit about 18. They tell them, go out, take a look at the world. You kind of go on a walkabout. If you don't want to stay there, you come back and seriously commit to this lifestyle. You join kind of our society, and you, you know that you're not missing things. Because I guess they thought, if not, guys were taken off when they were 30. But I just got to find out what it's like to be out in the world. So they go out, they party hard, they date, they dance, and then they decide to themselves, all right, I've tasted this. Is it worth it, or do I want to be back with my family and, and that society? I wonder if it's going to be as demeaning as the littlest groom, where it's the little people and there's little jokes and stuff like that going on. I didn't find the littlest uh, groom degrading, because I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> little tiny people going on dates. What more do you want? When they were dancing, I, I had to hit the TiVo. I was so happy. I guess in the premiere episode, the so-called normals, they get all disappointed when they find out what the point of the show is. They yeah. go to the Beverly Hills mansion, and they find out they're going to live with five Amish kids. Yeah, it's not exactly about you, okay? You're just an extra on this show. They should have used Mendonites as the normals, so it wouldn't be such a big shock. Details are coming out about Michael Jackson's conspiracy charges. Uh, the prosecution says Jacko panicked after the TV special about him aired, then kept the boy's family at his ranch and forced them to make a video saying Big Mike was innocent and never touched the kids. Yeah, I don't understand this story at all. I'm not completely buying into the family side of this one. Yeah, it's, I guess they're trying to come up with some explanation of why are you on videotape saying he's a great guy. And we and we love Michael, and he's never done anything wrong to us. I mean, if somebody abused your kid, you're going to make a video saying that he's a wonderful person and say, oh, I was forced to do that? You'd be freaking out trying to stab him. And I, uh, I guess it goes back to that interview he did with the London guy who said, it's all right to share your bed. Yeah. And then when he knew that the crap was going to hit the fan from that, that's when he started panicking. Again, Fezzi, you think that Mike thinks like you do, thinks like a normal. He's just so whacked out that there's no method to his madness. It's just flat out madness. Then they got to try to figure out why he did it after the fact. This is a Scooby-Doo episode, if this is true, because it's like the family's there, they're invited for a nice weekend, and when it's time to leave, the thunder strikes, and the doors automatically close shut and locked. Then you start whipping ass. Who's holding you? Michael Jackson. That's not as scary as you're letting on. You you beat him down, and then you leave to the front door. They're lucky that this is the only video that Michael asked the kid to make. Yeah. 
Well, who knows? Maybe there's more out there. Oprah was so impressed with a chicken sandwich she got in California that she bought the cafe. You know, you only got to buy them one at a time, Oprah. <laughs> there's no reason to just buy them all. And she doesn't even live in California. No, she just had, I guess she was visiting or something and just loved this chicken sandwich so much. Now, is her plan to take it uh, national? Is that the deal? I think what it was is the, the person who owned the cafe was going to close it. Right. And so I don't know if she knows what she's going to do with it, but she didn't want it to close. She wanted to keep being able to get these chicken sandwiches. Like well, that. why wouldn't you just hire him, have him move with you to your billion-dollar estate outside of Chicago, and he's just got to go get chicken sandwich every day? To me, that might be a sign of a real weight problem. If you're so worried about not getting your chicken curry sandwiches, you buy the cafe. I'm telling you right now, I want to try one of these sandwiches. I can't wait. This must be the best sandwich ever, because this woman knows food. One of the Simpsons characters will come out of the closet and get involved in a gay marriage, although producers aren't saying which character it is. Any guesses on this one? I got to figure... I'm going to go Lenny and the other guy, Fez. What are their names? Oh, Lenny and Carl. I always had a feeling that Lenny and Carl were gay. What's your uh, grab on it? I'm going to, for my radio psychic, I'll say Barney. Now that he's sobered up. Yeah, I know. I don't even get the sober Barney <laughs> thing. I can't even follow that story. So now that he's sobered up, I think he's going to realize his true self. All right, let's bring J-Dubs in for a radio psychic. Radio psychic. Radio psychic. It's easy. It's all the name. Mo. Yeah, I was thinking Mo, too. Mo would actually be uh, a decent guest there. I thought about Mo and, of course, the drink, the Flaming Mo. Yeah. They do a lot of flashbacks of when Mo was with women, though. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that he's not gay now. You know how they do that on TV. He's a cartoon. They can do whatever they want. They put Homer in space, and no one ever brings that up anymore. And also, when is this, is this breaking the first episode? I don't know if it's the first episode, but I think it's this new season coming up. All right, this uh, audience of feedback, what about Millhouse's divorced dad? <laughs> that seems perfect. Why not just make it Millhouse? I always thought he came <laughs> off a little gay. <laughs> so they said they'll probably avoid uh, being Smithers, since that's so obvious. Well, since he is gay, right? Yeah, and uh, Selma and Patty. They're supposed to be gay? Well, one married the uh, the movie star, yeah. or, or no, uh, Sideshow Bob, Yeah. and the other one never married. Well, weren't they both always obsessed with um, the oh. TV show? Oh, MacGyver. Yeah, they were both <laughs> obsessed with MacGyver. All right, I can't wait to see this now, Gay Simpsons character. This is, uh, this is as exciting as when they killed uh, Maude Flanders. Has there ever <laughs> been any other gay characters, uh, uh, cartoon characters? I'm gonna give you one, Fez. Who was the uh, that pa that uh, exit stage left? Oh, Snagglepuss. Snagglepuss, <laughs> I think, was definitely gay. He had a theater background. Yeah, I, I honestly, if I had to guess, I'd say that Snagglepuss was gay. Also, I would think that the Smurfs were fairly gay. Yeah, they only had one Smurfette, and no one went near her. What about uh, Mickey Mouse? It just seemed to me with a high voice and everything. A no pants? You were looking at a gay mouse. And a platonic relationship. Yeah. All right, we'll open up the phone lines to that one. Because that's kind of interesting when you think about it. What cartoon characters are, in fact, gay? Because the Simpsons are making a big deal out of this, Fez, like they came up with it. 866-277-4969. 866-277-4969. But if you look at uh, a lot of cartoon characters, I'm going to give you one right now. He-Man. He-Man is everything that you would see if you went to a gay club in America. I'll throw this one out. Dick Dastardly. Yeah, Dick Dastardly. Very, very gay. And you basically uh, look at him. And he's hanging around with a dog that appears to be somewhat of a bottom. He's very flamboyant, and not to mention just the name alone. All right, we're going to take a break here, Fezzy, and we'll come back and pick this up. Uh, 866-277-4969. Just back in a few moments, you're listening to The Ron and Fez Show.